movement, um, a movement of churches that worship outdoors and practice contemplative ecology, that listen for the word of God in place, in your X marks the spot, in a not only geography, but in an ecosystem kind of way. Um, and the other route to our communities, um, life and being is watershed discipleship. Um, just raise your physical hands. You don't have to do the complicated raising your hand on the screen thing. Um, if you are familiar with the term watershed discipleship. A little bit, a little bit of familiarity. So um, a, a recap for some of you and, uh, and, a, um, and an introduction for other folks. So the notion of a watershed in terms of kind of geology and geography is the water catchment area of any portion of landmass that drains into a common outlet. And so it's essentially, it's a little basin where the hills at the top demarcate the edges and the water flows down from the top of the mountain into a little trickle, into a stream, into a river, um, sometimes resting in lakes and then into the ocean. And very often at those, those peaks is where um, indigenous languages change, is where um, plant species change, is where weather patterns change. And so unlike the straight ruler lines that we draw on maps, um, watersheds are an older and more natural form of um, relationships in community. And in some ways, the people and the species and the, the geographic formations and the waterways um, and the creatures of our watershed, um, we're in a little lifeboat together. Those are the people on whom we depend the most. And where we practice our discipleship. So when we think also about the word watershed, more than this little lifeboat, we also use that word metaphorically. And so we talk about being at a watershed moment, a point where the thing that you do next could end up with big repercussions one way or another. So if top of the mountain, little raindrop poised over top, if you drop and roll down this way, you might end up in the Pacific. And if you went the other way, you might end up in the Gulf of Mexico and have a radically different experience. And in terms of global species extinction, in terms of climate change, we are very much at a watershed moment. And so we think about attention to our place and attention to our, um, our moment in the big arc of history as a way that we think about where do we practice our discipleship and how do we practice our discipleship? Discipleship is about discipline. So so Alan Cedar also talks about having um, three core disciplines. The first of those is watershed literacy, that we know our place, that we know the, the cedar and the salal and the chickadees and the brook trout and the, the creatures that are our neighbors in our watershed. Second discipline is to know our stories. In the, the colonial arc of history, how did I, as um, a person with roots in Europe, come to be worshiping on this Coast Salish territory? What are the ways that my family story intersects with the story of colonization? How did land come to be in my family and not in indigenous families? Um, then the third discipline that we take on is to know our tradition, to delve into the places where the relationship with our creature kin, with the expression of the divine or the sacred in creation is actually core to scripture and to the practice of our faith. So we're gonna jump right in um, and get some practice with that spiritual discipline in the book of Amos. Beth says that this is your first sustained encounter as a community with a prophet. So we're gonna start with prophets and what do they do? Amos is the earliest prophet whose prophecy 
has been recorded, has been written down. But in the biblical timeline, he's actually predated by others who were told are prophets, but we don't hear their prophecy. So um, some big names there would be Miriam, who sang at the Reed Sea, and her song is one of the oldest parts of the Bible. She is a parallel leader with Moses and Aaron, and often biblically those sibling relationships are about status. Um, Miriam has a host of water associations with her stories. Then there's Deborah, the judge and prophet. She was at the time the de facto leader of the Hebrews. Prior to the monarchy, during war with the Canaanites, she summons a general who has 10,000 in his army at his command. And she says, go to war. And he says, not unless you go with me. I'm not going if you don't go. So the role of prophets is key and pivotal. It is not gendered and it's not always about what people say, it's often about what people do. In terms of literature, if we think of the Hebrew Bible, um, there are three parts to the Hebrew Bible, the Torah, the law, the prophets, and the writings. So the, the Torah, the Nevaim, and the Ketuvim. So in terms of weight, it's kind of a third of the thing. When Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets, he's giving equal weight to those parts of scripture. And at the transfiguration, um, when Moses and Elijah appear, Moses represents the law, Elijah represents the prophets. So this is a major fundamental avenue that the community has access to the word of God. Um, there's a bunch of different elements in prophetic literature, but the ones that are most relevant to Amos are these. A prophet has an experience, receives a word, and communicates that word to both a people and to the, those who are in authority among the people. So both the people and the power structures. Um, do not zip to the to the share screen yet, but today in Amos's passage, um, Amos sees, so his, his vision, one verse. Then he hears, so there's a short narrative, three verses, and then he speaks, then he tells, and that's 10 verses long. So you can see kind of the relative weight um, of, the, of the seeing part. In popular imagination, we, we tend to think about prophets as predicting the future or, or being foreseers. Really what they're doing is reading the signs of the time. So an awful lot like um, authors of speculative fiction, like George Orwell or Octavia Butler, they're not so much telling you what's going to happen in a, in a prescient kind of magic way, but pointing to the consequences of the current situation. So you, you don't have to be a psychic to say to your kid, if you keep running in the hall in socks, you're gonna slip. Um, the Hebrew word, navi, means bubbling up or spring. It's one of many, many nature references that you're gonna keep on hearing. But the, the emphasis is on what comes up and what is shared not what's private and what's seen by the prophet. It's what the prophet shares that matters. In the biblical tradition, broadly, prophets can be lumped into two categories. You've got court prophets like Nathan, like Samuel, prophets who were urban near the political and religious capital, um, who sometimes called out, sometimes even called in the ruler or religious authorities but most often they were sort of apologists for the king. They were the, they were the, things are good the way they are. Things have never been better than the way they are. The other major group of prophets are the wilderness prophets. So Miriam, Elijah, John the Baptist, these are the outsiders. They are the spokespeople for an untamed God who come from the physical margins to the center 
to call for justice. Amos is interestingly non-binary in this respect. Amos is not really court and he's not really wilderness. In chapter um, seven, when the high priest and the king conspire to kick him out of Bethel, out of the capital, um, which is a, an accusation of sedition. So it's like one, one step below treason. Um, Amos defends himself with his very sort of sketchy bio. He says, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son. So he's disavowing the court tradition and the, the prophetic dynasties. He's like, I don't, I don't come from there, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. Now there's some ambiguity here, and this is important because Amos speaks as a champion of the economically exploited. But you can't really tell from the language whether he's the owner of flocks and herds or whether he is the worker of flocks and herds and, and the orchard worker. But he's clearly also not claiming the wilderness tradition here. He's strongly identifying with the care of animals and the care of trees. I think the last time you met, Kathy Kwan did an amazing job of amplifying the, the prophetic voice of Kimberly Latrice Jones with the video clip on the systemic impoverishment of black people. Um, I want to amplify some folks who are prophets to me. I want to hold up um, So and Pinar Sinopoulos Lloyd of Queer Nature. Um, and So says this about working as a shepherd. Sheep teach about the intelligence of the collective. They teach how ecological knowledge can be stored in the body. They teach about trust, accountability, and interspecies community. They also really teach about the gifts of fear and vigilance. Sheep have mad survival skills. So Amos is neither a court prophet nor a wilderness prophet, but he's a prophet of the pastoral of interspecies relationship. So looking at today's passage, we don't have to get that on the screen yet. Um, in verse one, God shows Amos a basket of summer fruit. Then the next couple of verses describes a temple song that is turned into wailing and dead bodies are scattered about the landscape. And then the rest of the chapter is this long oracle of destruction against those who practice economic exploitation. And economic exploitation is the, the predominant theme of Amos and it's the theme that, that you all are engaging with in this preaching series. So how do these fit together? Basket of fruit, dead bodies, um, condemnation, of exploitation. So I'm going to unpack the fruit basket a little bit. This gift from the guy who self-identifies as the dresser of sycamore trees. Um, a little detour here on the sycamore tree. It's not the plushy, luxurious fig that you're used to, you know, kind of like this big, um, but a, a hard, marble-sized fruit that grows on the trunk and the branches of the sycamore tree. It's one of those figs that requires um, pollination by a symbiotic wasp. It's a tree that people, that humans brought to the Mideast from North Africa. So there's another interspecies relationship here. Historically, the fruit only ripened in a way that humans could eat it if each individual little marble was incised with a knife. So super labor intensive. The word that describes what Amos does in relationship to sycamore trees only appears once in the Bible. And for several hundred years, um, this has been the primary translation, the understanding that, that Amos was the guy who went around to the sycamore trees and cut a little notch in each piece of fruit. Um, 
So over and over, this text emphasizes Amos as a prophet of interspecies dependence. Um, somebody else, another prophet that I just want to amplify the voice of here is Potawatomi um, moss botanist Robin Wall Kimmerer. Some of you will have heard of her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, which brings together um, the knowledge of, of biological sciences with indigenous traditional knowledge and, and is also a prophet of interspecies relationships. So back to the fruit basket. The um, verses can go up on the screen in the next little while. So if we imagine this fruit basket as like a lush, expensive, cellophane wrapped collection of fruit that um, comes from global extraction markets and, and sits in a luxury hotel. Then that switch between verse one and two to the wailing and the dead bodies is kind of the classic kind of Amos indictment of the wealthy um, that Beth talked about in the first sermon. Um, so this is, this is just a complete slam and, and sudden turn um, for the wealthy who, for whom life is a bowl of cherries. But the, but the vision is more than that. There's a, um, a linguistic play on words that comes in here. So in the Hebrew, the summer fruit, quietz, sounds like end, ketz. So kind of a, a translation or, or um, interpretation that might convey some of the meaning. And the, the um, interpretation that you have up does do some of this echoing. But here's what happens. Yahweh God showed me a basket of ripe fruit and said, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a basket of ripe fruit. And Yahweh said, the time is ripe for my people Israel. Never again will they get a pass from me. Your hymns will be turned into wailing and dead bodies will be everywhere shut up. And then the economic exploitation. And it's connected, if you can scroll to the next screen, I think, um, that economic exploitation is connected with religious infidelity, with lack of covenant faithfulness. So when you exploit the poor, that is when you are being unfaithful to your God. So the, the way that in the, the kind of most famous Amos verse and the verse that was dealt with last time, the, the justice and righteousness are completely intertwined. Um, condemnation that the, sab that the Sabbath is not extended to the land, that you are not observing the new moon festivals and the Sabbath festivals and the, the systemic genius of the law of the Torah is that, that the Bible says that we have the best legal system. We know how to get it right with God. And built into that is the knowledge that we're going to screw up, that we're going to accumulate, and we need to redistribute, and we need to rest. Um, and so there's condemnation for violating that um, law of rest. And the means for that violation is trade in agricultural surplus. God says, I'm not going to forget this. There will be an earthquake and the land will be like the rising and the falling of the Nile. There will be an eclipse. Your feasts will turn to mourning. And that's echoing the, the earlier verse about the hymns and the wailing, but it's personalized now as though for the death of an only son. I'm going to send a famine not for food, but for the word. So you're going to be hungry for profits. And God's getting a little bit pissy here. This is like, I am going to give you the side treatment. And you will be sorry then when you don't hear from me. All right, so away with that screen. And back to the bigger picture of how does this um, chapter fit into the book of Amos. Now, because this is the kind of Bible nerd that I am, 
um, in prep for this sermon, I took the book of Amos and I just pulled out the parts that pertained um, to land, to animal, to plant, to the, the elements. Turns out that makes up a quarter of the book and is really when you read it all in a row, um, sort of a poetic and succinct summary of the, of the whole book. So I'm gonna read you a couple of examples here um, and I won't read the whole thing, but it's really fun. Among the shepherds before the earthquake, the Lord roars, the pastures of the shepherds wither, and the top of the mountain dries up. They've threshed with threshing sedges of iron. I will send a fire. I will send a fire that shall devour. I will send a fire, fire that shall devour. I destroyed the people whose height was like the cedars and who were as strong as oaks. I destroyed their fruit above and their roots beneath. I led you for 40 years in the wilderness to possess the land of others. He will break out on you like fire. The one who made the Pleiades and Orion and who turns the deep darkness into morning and darkens the day into night, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the surface of the earth. So when I looked at Amos this way, there were a bunch of patterns. Um, pervasively, God's anger is like fire. God will send a fire. Um, 12 times in a very short book do we have threats of fire. Um, the passage that I love, uh, or the passages that I love, five times God is compared to a lion. And the, the threat of coming into contact with the divine um, is like the line from, um, from the Wizard of Oz. So the dangers of lions and snakes and bears. Oh my. God's outrage over economic exploitation is repeatedly expressed in terms of harm to the crops. So if we go back and think about Amos as being the prophet of, um, of the pastoral tradition, issuing judgment against agriculture, that's just something to, to file away and think about some more. Another recurring theme is awe at creation and awe at the creator. So especially the seas, the heavens, the repeating um, rhythms of the cosmos of the day of, of light and dark. And the notion that um, how, how amazing these things are and by implication, how much more amazing is their creator? Nature and particularly animals um, in Amos express a fundamental appropriateness. The, the things that animals do are the right things. The, the way that nature is, is natural. Repeatedly, and we've seen this a little bit already, extraction, the excess of the wealthy and the exploitation of the poor are all mediated by the elements and plants and creatures. And so are the judgments and so is the restoration. So this, this indictment of economic injustice in ecological language is in some ways not surprising. In English, the words economy and ecology come from the Greek. They come from the same word oikos for household. So once again, we're coming back to what the, the folks at Queer Nature tell us about interspecies kinship and relationship. Typically, we think about the characters in a prophetic book as being 
um, the prophet, God, and the people. But this exercise shows that the land, the creation, the more than human world is another, is an equal conversation partner. Hilary Marlowe of the Earth Bible Project, and um, you can hear more about that from Beth later, um, looks at this same material and concludes that the, the earth in Amos is another prophet. So responding to the word of God, cooperating with God, revealing the word of God and, and calling out judgment. So Amos and the earth are, are in parallel roles here. And, and just a reminder, what is being judged in Israel and Judah is different from what's being judged in the surrounding nations. Israel and Judah are judged for a corporate sin of systemic economic injustice. The individuals participate in those systems, but it's not a judgment of individuals for their particular pursuits. So it's not about what Mark did on Tuesday. Um, so then the question is, so what? Um, thrilling as this is for the Bible nerds among us, what does this have to do with life in the Lower Fraser watershed? Um, what does this have to do with life on Coast Salish territory? On land stewarded from time immemorial by Musqueam, Squamish, and Tisleweth people, how do we read this text? So um, we're going to do a brainstorm now. You all are going to do it in the um, chat. I'm going to talk a little bit so you have some time to get your thinking caps on and, and your writing. And then maybe Beth or Mark can, um, I'll leave a spot and you all can, can read what comes up in the chat. But the question is, how in our time, how in our place, are ecology and economy linked? So I'll start you out. What are the major industries in the province of British Columbia? When I was in school, I learned um, fishing, logging, mining, and then um, an add-on, sometimes we would talk about tourism. Um, agriculture is also one of those. So fundamentally, um, the economics of this place are connected with um, the creatures and the elements of this place. Key role of residential schools was to physically and relationally remove indigenous children from their land. And yet land is this tremendous source of wealth in the province. I see that there's some stuff going up. So um, somebody want to read? Uh, tourism as an industry and um, natural resources being used to boost the economy, forestry, some things that are happening. Climate change disproportionately impacts indigenous people, northern people, island and coastal people, um, and environmental racism disproportionately impacts um, climate justice. So through storm and famine, um, those people then become climate refugees, which also has an impact on our place. In, um, when we think about COVID, um, the, which is a disease that has crossed species, one group of people who are disproportionately impacted are um, folks who work in industrial meat, fish, and poultry work. And so again, that's a, um, people who are very often from racialized communities, people who are um, in contact with use of creatures in um, an industrial and extractive way. I think there's some other stuff coming up in the chat. <clears throat> Got oil, property development, and the fact that one of the main things that stalls development is bylaws to protect trees. Mm -hmm. uh, responses from the city of Vancouver to climate emergencies um, related to transportation and resource use. Um, and then I think more around mining, fishing, agriculture, logging, um, LNG, Trans Mountain Pipeline. 
y'all are ticking all of my boxes here. Um, another one is the, um, the repeated call in Amos about fires and the um, increase, the annual increase in forest fires that are climate change related, but they're also related to policies that are about protecting property and protecting the, the monetary investments of settlers and that displace a, a, a much older tradition of deliberately setting caretaking fires that would, um, by indigenous people, that would restore productivity and reduce the danger of bigger fires. I think also about sort of the false pitting of um, workers against the environment is kind of a key issue here. All of these are about interspecies relationships that are out of balance. You see a couple more coming up in the chat. Yeah, we've got farm fishing, removing homeless people, uh, disproportionately indigenous homeless people from urban green spaces, while wealthy house people uh, are recreate when not recreate when not working. Um, those who see their job as mitigating their impact or work for sustainability, many more cleave to the jobs economy environment binary. So the next question to think about is how does the earth speak a prophetic word to us today? Things that I think about are um, extinctions and the loss of biodiversity and that, that absence of creature companions resonates really strongly with the, the famine of Amos 8.11 that that um, that absence of creatures that we evolved alongside is a voice that we're hungry for. Julia says the fires in the past few summers. Big catastrophic events. Um, storms and fires and floods and droughts out of season um, happening with increasing frequency. Cherry trees and lindens in the downtown east side dying from drought, Japanese beetle effects. Fires in Australia, air quality decrease, decline in songbirds, insects. 70% less wildlife than when Tracy was 12 years old in the world today. So the next the question is, how do we attend to that prophetic word? Um, Mark and Kathy, I think their sermons talked about um, how do we identify prophets or who are prophets? And my questions are more about how do we become people who hear prophecy and are attuned to that? Um, I'm gonna, coming close to the end here, I'm gonna propose two ways that I think that we can better attune ourselves and to attend to prophecy. Um, one that I'm pretty good at, um, one that I'm pretty terrible at. The first is one of the, the things that Salal and Cedar is good at. And curiously, if you, found a community, then sometimes those things overlap. Um, but the practice of contemplation in nature, um, by going to be directly, if you possibly can, even in a pandemic, to attend to the waters and the rocks and the plants and the creatures of a particular place, even if it's going out on your balcony, even if it's attending to pets and houseplants and parks and gardens, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, capital letters, wilderness, but attention and noticing and being with, asking questions and offering thanks are ways of, of cultivating those kin relationships that the folks at Queer Nature come to. Um, it's about attending to suffering 
but it's also about noticing what other messages are there. It's about listening for the word of those places and those creatures. Um, the second practice, and this is the one that I'm not so good at, is to pay attention to your feelings. Um, I tend to think that feelings are overrated, but I think that pretty consistently um, the prophetic tradition says otherwise. Um, Hilary Marlowe, the person with the Earth Bible Project, um, who said that, that the land is a prophet in Amos, points out that when God roars, the pastures mourn, that there is a response, an emotional response of grief in the land to the word of God. Walter Brueggemann, who is um, incredibly important modern interpreter of the prophetic, he says, it is the task of prophetic ministry and imagination to bring people to engage with their experiences of suffering and death. When Kathy Kwan shared the words of the prophet Kimberly Jones, she reminded us that prophets both have and evoke big feelings. And I think that those are the way sort of to and through the divine word. It is my deep prayer those of us who are gathered here, that members of this community will attend to the myriad voices of our hurting earth. We will feel our feelings and that we will thirst for the justice that rolls down like waters, that torrent, that stream that the prophets bubble up that we will have that hunger for the world, for the word, and that we will be so hungry for it that we will run to and fro seeking that word, that thing, that action. Amen. <laughs>